Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they say flexibility is the key to air power, so this morning we are inside because the weather in Oshkosh is a little inclement today. We're expecting the rain showers to go away, but welcome to Warburton Review, uh, the 20th anniversary of our show. We're very happy today to be welcoming a group of uh, very distinguished chipmunk owners, uh, pilots, and um, I should start and I'll get out of the way here and uh, get the program going shortly. I have to say thank you to the people who make this possible. That is the Scott's Miracle Grow Company, Jim Hagedorn, uh, who has been our sustaining sponsor for many years. And the uh, beautiful room that we're in now is uh, typically the green room. And our producer, Scott Guy, had just told me earlier we should say to Ron and Diane Fagan, that we need a studio actually now so that when this happens to us uh, we have more room but we're uh, we're being flexible again and the uh, sleeping dog crew is doing a wonderful job we're going to present this to you from inside today later on you will be able to see the chipmunk aircraft on the ramp as soon as the weather permits uh, we started with a set of air stairs years ago and uh, we have come to this level of uh, production, which we're very proud to say. Uh, again, thank you to Ron and Diane Fagan for providing us with this beautiful building. Uh, so, Teresa Eamon is our singer. She normally uh, introduces the show. Uh, you can uh, hear Teresa hopefully this afternoon for our uh, next event. She'll be uh, back, not singing in the rain, but singing some wonderful uh, songs for us. So, uh, a little uh, after our introduction video, uh, it will be um, a pleasure to introduce a moderator that we have recruited that is new to this program, and that would be uh, Brigadier General Retired Ed McElhenney. He will introduce our chipmunk owners and pilots, but to get the show started, please direct your attention to the video. I'm Richard Wilshire and I'm uh, at Flaybob Riverside Airport in Southern California. Behind me we have two de Havilland chipmunks, a type which uh, these days there are probably 400 of them surviving out of nearly 1300 that were built. And the reason we're here is that 75 years ago today the prototype took flight at Downsview in Ontario, Canada. The pilot was Pat Fillingham and when he came back from that flight he said to the uh, uh, waiting designer and uh, board members, you have a winner. And so we're here today gathering to celebrate that 75th anniversary. The day started with three chipmunks in New Zealand gathering. There have been other gatherings around the world, literally. And just the way the time zones work, we at Flaybob are now the tail end of that. Twenty twenty one marks the seventy fifth anniversary of the first flight of the de Havilland Chipmunk, regarded by many as the finest handling production light aircraft of all time. It is said that the de Havilland DHC one Chipmunk looks the way an aeroplane should look. The Chippy, as it is affectionately called by its devotees, was designed as a single engine tandem two seat primary trainer. The prototype chipmunk first flew on 22 May 1946 at Downsview, Toronto, and was flown by de Havilland test pilot Pat Fillingham. It was the first indigenous aircraft to emerge from de Havilland, Canada, and hence the designation DHC-1. 217 chipmunks were constructed at Downsview, and a further 1,000 produced under license in the UK, initially at Hatfield and then at Haywarden. 
66 chipmunks were also produced in Portugal, leading to a total worldwide production of 1,283 aircraft. The de Havilland chipmunk had a very long service life and now enjoys a long civilian flying life. As many have survived, it has created the opportunity to sample the joys of flying a historic aircraft, one that is regarded as one of the great pilot's aeroplanes. Currently, there are approximately 350 airworthy chipmunks in civilian hands, of which 100 are in the United States and 138 are in the United Kingdom. The remaining aircraft are scattered worldwide. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ed McElhenney. Welcome to Warbirds in Review, Air Venture 21. Um, I am the recruit that Connie talked about. Um, I'm, I'm new to this program, and uh, I am honored to be here to uh, celebrate a birthday, a anniversary, if you will, of the chipmunk. Um, I, uh, again, it is, it is an honor to, to, to be here and to bring this to you, and we've got four distinguished chipmunk people here um, who are going to be talking a little bit about the airplane um, and I'm just going to be kind of the rudder of the ship if you will. I'm going to try to steer these guys in the right direction and uh, hopefully it will all come out of this a little bit smarter about the chipmunk and uh, and yeah we don't have a birthday cake here today but I think we, uh, we, we are celebrating that birthday. I'm going to introduce uh, Richard Wilshire who is uh, I'll say now after reading some of his information about the chipmunk, probably one of the most uh, knowledgeable about the airplane. Uh, he is an owner, in fact he owns an airplane, uh, a chipmunk that went around the world, and we'll talk about that later also. Uh, an enthusiast, uh, a pilot, uh, and as I said, uh, the guy who's going to be kind of orchestrating this program a little bit with some of his closest friends down the road here. So, uh, Richard, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you get this going and uh, start the celebration. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. Well, I guess the first thing, I'd like to assure everybody that after all the changes of aircraft and personnel and location, the high professional standing of this is going to be complete luck. <laughs> <laughs> There's been no rehearsals. So I'll keep my fingers crossed. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, the last time I brought the chipmunk, to Oshkosh was in 2018 and on my way home I stopped at this apparently deserted airfield, was fueling and this truck came up. Guy got out and said, simply the finest airplane you can fly. And this was a guy who was actually an ag pilot but he had about 50 hours in a chipmunk. And I think that's just a classic statement. It's debatable, people will argue otherwise, but there's, there's no doubt that the chipmunk is certainly a delightful airplane to fly and uh, I've never taken anybody up in it who hasn't got out with a silly smile on their face. And how old is this airplane now? My particular airplane is going to be uh, 69 next month. Okay, but the birthday celebration it's is 75, 75, 75 years. 75 years old, yeah, and a few months today, yeah. Cool. And so, yeah, um, fabulous airplane. But the reason it exists is that uh, during, 19, well, during the Second World War, most of the training that was done in the British Commonwealth countries was done in Tiger Moths and the, uh, the parent company in the UK realised that they needed a replacement for the Tiger Moth so they decided they needed to get on with the trainer replacement but the problem was at the time they were so busily involved in developing the Vampire which was a jet fighter, the, uh, the Dove which was a, a transport aircraft which you would you know, consider to be perhaps the, um, the king air of the day let's say and also, importantly, the uh, Comet airliner, which was the world's first jet airliner. And in fact, the pictures that we've just seen are all of Canadian-operated aircraft of those types. In mm -hmm. fact, the Royal Canadian Air Force was the first in the world to operate jet transports. So, um, the directors of, of the UK company wanted to um, 
offload this this um, responsibility and where better to go than to their Canadian office. Now it so happened that in the boardroom in 1928 one of the directors had pulled out his iPad, whipped up for flight and said look there's this lovely place in Downsview, Ontario, let's go build a factory there. That's what they did. <laughs> so in 1945 one of the directors from the UK was over in, in Canada, saw a model of a trainer and basically said if you can build it, I'll sell it. And so, um, it's a shame actually we're not outside, because I was hoping there might be somebody Polish in the audience to help me here. But uh, a gentleman called Wysowolod Jakimiuk, yeah, I'm not going to say that twice, mm -hmm. um, took on the design role of the Chitmunk, and uh, they produced in uh, something like seven months from, from a letter saying, this is what we're going to do, and it's important to the company, that we, we get our own in-house design capability. Um, they produced that aircraft in about seven months and had it rolled out and flying on the 22nd of May, 1946. Wow. Wow. So, um, you know, we, I could talk all day about this, but mm -hmm. you don't want me to, so let's cut it quickly. Well, let's, let's, let's first talk, I mean, you, it, it is a uh, Canadian-developed aircraft. It is. But, and, and, they were built there initially, but then it expanded from there. Yeah, well, not just initially, but more in parallel. So okay. what happened was, uh, the Canadians produced five or six airframes initially, and they had two under test, and they had some they were shipping to uh, other countries where there were de Havilland offices. Mm -hmm. um, they lost one in, in a spinning accident uh, with a, a late recovery. The pilot survived. Um, that left them an aircraft down, and then the head, head office decided they needed the prototype in the UK to start evaluating it. So that got shipped, they produced another test article uh, for use in Canada, and they shipped two more airframes, numbers 10 and 11, also to the UK. So there were three Canadian shipments in the UK then being used for evaluation. At the same time, they were developing the aircraft still in Canada as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and bear in mind, there was no uh, government requirement specification for this aircraft. It was simply de Havilland UK saying we, we're going to need a replacement for the Tiger Moth, which was prevalent. You know, it was like the steerman of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, they had to start working on convincing the, um, the, the uh, well, Ministry of Air at the time and the Royal Air Force that they needed this aeroplane. So the, the evolution of the aircraft was happening in parallel with a lot of exchange between the two countries. I mean, for, for example, the power plant, it started off at 130 horsepower, which was basically a Tiger Moth engine put in a new tin airframe. Mm -hmm. um, so they introduced the, um, the, the Mark 8 uh, Gypsy Major, which had 145 horsepower, and at the same time as they were trialing that in the UK, they were also developing that in parallel in Canada. In fact, they couldn't actually operate in the UK until they had an authority to do so from the <laughs> Canadian designers, <laughs> even though it was the head office. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yep. Yeah. So, so as it turned out, I mean, how many were produced eventually in Canada? How many in England? Or oh, excuse me, <coughs> Great Britain. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> well I, I, good, I got caught on that good yesterday. Recovery. And good then, uh, and then also in Portugal. Yeah. So um, they produced a total of two hundred and seventeen in Canada. Okay. Um, something like a hundred or so, and I forget the precise numbers right now, uh, went to the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. Mm -hmm. Some of those, in fact, went into the refresher flying training program. So they weren't actually in direct RCAF um, operation. Okay. Um, they produced exactly 1,000 in the UK, of which 740 went into, well, people will say the RAF, but in fact it was the Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy, and also the Army Air Corps. And then in Portugal, um, they were looking for a replacement for their Tiger Moths, and what they did was they took 10 from the UK, began to operate those, but took one of them apart, built the jigs for them, and then built a further, um, 60 under license and following that because of attrition they produced a further six so the Portuguese produced the last chipmunk built that came off the line in 1961 mm. and the Canadians produced the first in 1946 so that was the product, total production span. And, and from a pilot standpoint any one version better than any other? I mean if, if, if I were to buy one today 
you know, would people say, oh, buy the Portuguese or buy the... Well, I'm, I'm almost going to defer that question to Harry because I know he's going to have a very... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there are differences, there are subtle differences in handling planes. Some will tell you that uh, the Canadian airplane airframe is a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. The canopies are different in the later model Canadian aircraft. And so the... Um, where the windscreen bow comes over is further forward in the British ones. So in the Canadian ones, it's further back, and I've not got a lot of time flying Canadian aircraft, but it does tend to offer a little bit of impedance to one's view. Okay. Um, the handbrake, it might seem silly, but by the way, it's got a handbrake. Okay. The handbrake lever is different in the Canadian ones, and it's not quite so such a natural hold. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, I'm sure you could ask the same question of Harry. Okay. Okay, and uh, just a, as an aside, and you can, you probably know the answer, but did Prince Charles learn to fly in a chipmunk? As it, happened, I, I, it was a rumor I'd heard. Mm -hmm. No, no, he learned to fly in WP903, which I've had the privilege of flying. So he and, did. Uh, that he, aircraft still flies. It is in bright royal red. Uh, I think it's actually, it's, I think it might be called Guards Red or something. <laughs> but it's, um, yeah, it's bright red, and on the top of the, 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 the canopy bow, it has a large flashing red light, which I think says, keep well away. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess this up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. That's not uh, what I always call the light. But okay. I just had to verify. I yeah, just heard. It's now, it, now it's been And verified. also in New Zealand, there is a chipmunk in which um, possibly Prince Philip or Prince Edward or some, one of the other yeah, ones. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll, Still going. I'll, Okay, I'll, I'll, the, the, the ship rudder is turning now, and now can we talk sure. to your, your close friend here? Let's do that. Henning has um, a... Well, why don't you tell him? Tell him about your yeah. chipmunk. So uh, my name is uh, Henning Henningson. I'm uh, one of the other chipmunk owners, and my airplane, if we were doing this live, you would see is in the first prototypes of Canadian markings. Okay. And it had a number of samples when it was built. They were modeled not only in England, but the prototypes had various things that came uh, later, if you will. And as, as Richard said, there's a few key things to understand about the chipmunk. One of them is, is that, first of all, its propeller does turn the other way. The other way. So it's left rudder, left rudder, left rudder. <laughs> but then, as Richard also described, there's a handbrake. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't have toe brakes, and you can get a little push and a little stop on each side, but you will at some point reach for that left brake. Yeah. And it's, it's very subtle, but very necessary. <laughs> <laughs> um, I understand. And when you looked at some of these, you might realize that the Canadian chippies all did start with greenhouse type canopies. Mm -hmm. And it described with Richard, it's a little farther forward. Yeah, and let people know what the, the, the other canopy was, a bubble. Right, okay. and the bubbles came in much later. Okay. So what happened was, out of the entire production for uh, chippies on the Canadian side, only 47% of those actually had the bubble canopy. Hmm. And uh, I believe later, once they were came um, into the civilian hands, more people put the bubble canopies on because it's become a little more prepared. Yep. Um, in the big picture production of you know close to 1,500 chippies, only about 17, 18% had bubble canopies hmm. out of that total production number. Wow. Um, but there's some other nuances. So for example, in the original Canadian ones in the back seat, they were just straight panels. Mm -hmm. uh, the instructor in back typically couldn't see around very well, so they came to these little bit of blown out yep. type panels. So on approach and you could tuck your head down and look yep. to see how things were lining up. Yep. Uh, you might notice some spin strakes on the back. Uh, my particular airplane does not have those. Those came a little later. They're just forward of the rudder, correct? Correct. Okay. And the beauty of those was they, there was had been an accident, and uh, somebody barely high in the Royals had uh, spun it passed, yeah. spun it in, and they when they came down to it, they said we have to blame it on something, and yep. they put in the spin stakes on um, number two T thirty. 
341, I believe. Somewhere anyway, around there. and uh, it was a modification that went into every particular mm. mod. Mm. Um, later on, it proved that, um, arguably, among some people, that they absolutely did nothing for oh. safety. <laughs> Speaking of which, though, how about, how about rotor wise? You know, when, when you go to the super chipmunks, we'll get there later. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, that was one of the first things they did, wasn't it? Put a big rudder on the thing. That was one of the nicest things compared to some of the World War II planes and trainers that lost rudder effectiveness on landing, and you absolutely have to keep the going straight, yep. like the Stearmans or oh, PT-26 yeah. Cornells. Yep. But Chippy has a beautiful big rudder on it, and they made it even bigger uh, after about the first, oh, about 1948 yep. or so came the, the mod. Okay. And believe me, it's, it's such a blessing. It's very, very, very light on the controls, mm -hmm. and it absolutely can save you when things, when you need a little extra edge. Understand, understand. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no, uh, good explanations. And now <clears throat> we've we've got the senior mentor here of our group. <laughs> yes, um, we do. And I'll I'll let Richard introduce uh, this gentleman to us. Um, and he is yeah, a man who that's... who trained on these things. Uh, a former member of the Royal Canadian Air Force um, ended up flying F eighty sixes, as I remember. That's but right. I'll, I'll yeah. let Richard uh, do the, the yeah, honors. Uh, uh, Harry and I met uh, when I first put my chippy here in two thousand and ten. And, and this is Harry. This is Harry Shoney. Okay, He's right here. Okay, <laughs> and. Uh, He's a very forthright guy. He doesn't mess around with his opinions, and he'll tell you what he thinks. In fact, I had a, I was messing around, hesitating getting my engine fixed, and Harry called me one day and said, I've just spoken to this guy, this is his number, call him now, and I did. Now, I'll follow Harry anywhere, and in fact, I have. We've got a nice uh, picture somewhere of us <laughs> in, in, a, yeah, in a three ship, um, going past the Grand Teton at 13,500 feet. <laughs> I naively just kept on following. Just follow. him. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so um, yeah, he's a very he's a very uh, knowledgeable character about chipmunks. He's usually got two or three in his ownership. There we are. Look at that picture there. Uh, um, so Harry, why don't you tell us something about uh, your training? Oh, there's one thing I have to add. I've I've seen Harry being uh, interviewed sitting in his aircraft one eight zero four eight. And he starts to tear up when he talks about his training days. So he did. He did. <laughs> he did, Harry. Yeah. He did, Harry, come He's on, on it good. tell us yeah. about it. I understand that. I, I <clears throat> didn't get there. Why wouldn't he? I joined the Canadian Air Force in 1956, right out of high school, and uh, through all of our selection and whatnot, 30 of us got assigned to the. Uh, to flying to be pilots. And uh, after many, many, many months of ground school and what all, we got to go and fly. So um, in December of 1956, uh, my first trip was in an airplane 18056, which Matt Jolly Warburg radios down the road here, mm -hmm. which he has. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was 25 hours of flying in a chipmunk. And the idea was to see if you could fly because initially the Canadian Air Force took you right into the Harvard, the AT-6. Yeah. Right out of the right out of the field, you'd be taken off the farm and into an AT-6, which was a challenge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, I was in the I don't know second or third class for the chipmunk, mm -hmm. and we even had guys who didn't make the chipmunk. Well. Flying, and as you said, there is no easier aircraft to fly. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> from there, I went on to the uh, Harvard mm -hmm. for uh, seven, eight months, 200 hours, and the T-33 for 90 hours, and then the F-86 for uh, I don't remember the I don't remember how many hours the school was. And then I was based in France for three years and about 600 hours. Wow. Wow. So, and one wife. And one wife. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, how about, you know, when you went through your training in the chipmunk, um, was it an all-encompassing? You said you got about 25 hours in it. Yeah. Um, and did they do everything in that 25? I mean, did you do aerobatics? I mean, takeoffs and landings, obviously. You do aerobatics, you do spins. Did you do everything then? Well. In the initial part of your flying training, 
stalls, spins, obviously. Yep. Because when you got around 12 <coughs> hours, 10 to 12 hours, you were expected to go solo. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't make it by 15, you had to go back to the farm. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, it was just how to fly the airplane, how to hold on. Okay. And uh, spins, stalls. So you did all that. Take yep. off and landings. Yep. And uh, try not to get in trouble. Yep, I understand. <laughs> and, uh, and after the fact, did you come back? Did you? And you, are you a chipmunk owner? Did you own several for many, many years? When I finished F-86 school in Chatham, New Brunswick, I had a month off before I went to Europe. Mm -hmm. And on my way home, I stopped in Centralia, which is just north of London, Ontario, mm -hmm. where the Chipmunk School is. And uh, I got a room in the officer's quarters and went over to the officer's mess and found an instructor. And I said, I want to go flying in a Chipmunk. And he said, you're crazy. Here you are flying an F-86 and you want to fly a chip on. <laughs> I said, you know, it's the nicest airplane in the world. So anyhow, he took me up and we had a nice time. And uh, it was many, many, many years later before I got a chipmunk. I had to build a lot of tiger moths. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> a little French problem there. My wife wasn't keen on some of these things. <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> in Oshkosh, many, many years ago, Bill Rose, um, who had a big meat packing plant, had a little compound here on, um, right under the T-33, mm -hmm. where he had a little camp, and he had four chipmunks, a seaplane, Harvard, you know, a lot yeah. of airplanes. And I came out in my tiger moth one year with my first tiger moth because my two roommates from Pan Am were members of the group. Okay. And um, flew around with my tiger moth with everybody doing their thing. And I said to Bill one day, boy, when you get ready to get rid of one of those, because I flew both of those into service and he was rebuilding 056. Mm -hmm. And then one day, some years later, uh, I got a telephone call. I missed that year. Okay. And I got a telephone call, and they were uh, having some kind of a party. And Bill Rose said he would sell me an airplane. So uh, I didn't. I never even asked how much he wanted. I said, T "I'll take it." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they they eventually all got sold off to um, a friend of mine down in Georgia who had um, basically all of them, all four. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went to different people. My, the, the chap that I flew out with here, Navy pilot, he has 18049 and I have 18048, mm -hmm. both of which I flew in the Air Force. Wow. So uh, I've had a long career. Wow. With, uh, wow. Great way to start, too, it sounds like. Well, uh, you know, couldn't uh, have been better. Yep. Yeah. Couldn't have been better. Yep. Well, thank you. And before I forget, well, we've got a story with Richard about his airplane. And uh, again, I was doing a little bit of research, and, and I, I read the story, and I said, it, it flew around the world? I want to hear more about this. <laughs> uh, it's something about 90 miles an hour. It was 90 knots. I can't remember. It, does, what, yeah. it yeah. cruises yeah. at 90 knots. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I anyway, I, I'd like to hear the story about this airplane that went around the world. Okay. Well, um, it was one of two um, in 1996, which simple arithmetic will tell you it was the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, some guys within the Royal Air Force said, well, we, you know, we should celebrate the aircraft by sending two of them somewhere. And they thought of Australia at first, and the, the higher command said, well, they never operated any, how are you gonna get them back? So they decided, okay, well, we'll, go, we'll just go around the world and we'll visit Downsview, which actually was a far better idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they put that plan in place, off they went, um, and by the time they got to Moscow, they got held up there and eventually it was argued that, well, there are these nasty fires across Siberia, you'd basically be flying in IMC, um, you've got to turn around. 
Well, they weren't to be just pushed aside that easily. Um, and in particular, the pilots that were flying these aircraft, or have been hoping to, um, push for it to happen nonetheless. And it, so it happened in 1997. So next year will actually be the 25th anniversary of Northern Venture, as the RAF called it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been very fortunate in, um, I was in a position where I was able to buy an airplane. I had always liked chipmunks. So I just Googled around and I found that this particular one, RAF WP833, was up for sale. And I was kind of, you know, just entranced by its history mm -hmm. and what it had done. And I also learned that um, someone had offered the, the, the sellers full price, bring it to my airfield, I'll have the money transferred before you've even pushed it into my hangar. But he wanted it for glider towing and it probably would have had a lycoming on the mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to offend Nathan, but you take that gypsy major out of a chipmunk, it doesn't look right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It might, you might call it a tin sardine, but it looks right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, to, because I wanted to preserve the aircraft, I, I bought it. Didn't really realize quite what an aircraft I was getting into. I made contact with the two pilots that had flown it around the world, um, Sid Hughes and Bill Purchase, and I've become particularly good friends with Bill. Um, in fact, Bill has given me his flight suit, his helmet. I've got all of the around the world charts. Wow. Um, and basically, you know, they, they set off uh, across uh, Western Europe, across Russia, um, coming up with some really, really interesting situations. I mean, they would fly into what they were told was a grass strip. They'd turn up to find it's just dirt and mud. They were running on Avgas and Mogas. Mm. And don't forget, the chipmunk has a two-hour endurance. But they put an extra gas tank in that thing they too, did. right? Yeah. Yes, yes, they put, so the, in, in Imperial gallons, it's got an 18, the RAF versions have an 18-gallon capacity. How else what's the, the Canadian, 24? It's a 19 uh, Imperial. Not, in the Canadian models? 12, no, I'm sorry, 24. 24, yeah, okay. okay, 24 in the Canadians. Because of the weight of the radio equipment the RAF wanted to put in, they, the way to reduce the weight was to reduce the size of the fuel capacity, because it's just a trainer who's going to be out for more than two hours. Mm. So they dropped a 24 imperial gallon, so over doubling the fuel, yeah. into the rear cockpit okay. in lieu of the seat. And that gave them range. And in fact, the, the longest flight they made was four hours, 55 minutes, as they worked their way across, mm. Um, mm. up, uh, towards the Bering Strait, and in fact, the picture we're showing right now is the two chipmunks on top. Oh yeah, um, crossing the Bering Strait, five and a half thousand feet. That actually was taken by Bill Purchase, who was riding the support ship, mm -hmm. the uh, the Britain Norman Islander. Mm -hmm. And I've got all of those charts, including one where they proposed a route to include Air Venture, oh. but the dates just didn't work out. But yeah. I've got the chart showing it, proving that it's not just a, a wild claim; yep. it's there. Yep. So yeah, they, um, wow. this is at Whitehorse, I think, that shot there. This is arriving in, in Nome, um, where they had the comfort of um, warm showers, clean uh -huh. beds. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So just to go back to the, the fueling, going across um, the Russian Federation, they had a great problem getting hold of a 100 LL mm -hmm. gas. They would actually carry some in cans, in, you know, in, in barrels, in the Islander. Uh. They would uh, get mo gas and put it in the auxiliary tank, put the 100 LL in the main tanks, take off and land on the mains, cruise on the mo gas, and they just had a red light on, on, uh, attached to a, 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 an electronic sensor. And when the red light came on, they would switch back to the wing tanks, and that would just drain out. But all three tanks at the time would run and just drain it out. That's how they'd go. What an adventure. It was, yeah. yeah I realize yeah. there's not much room for stuff in oh, the yeah. car. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> no, there isn't, isn't, no. Wow. You to, to, two packs of Kleenex and you're done. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and this picture we're looking at now is when they arrived home at uh, RAF Kinloss. Huh. And the ironic thing, perhaps, is that in the hangar there is a Nimrod. Yeah. Which was an extension of the Comet, which yeah. was part of the reason why this is a Canadian design. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a certain yep. irony in that picture, I think. Yep, I agree. So it took them 63 days. They did nearly 17,000 um, miles, nautical miles, and um, <clears throat> each pilot did approximately 115 hours flying. Whew. Yeah, and at times they were exhausted. Wow. I mean, I, 
I've just flown um, 21 hours from Southern California on just my two hour tanks. And that was and, long enough, uh, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm, I was brain dead by the end of the first day. I understand. <laughs> All right, uh, again, the rudder is going to turn a little bit. We've got about a little less than 10 minutes to go here, and I want to introduce a guy at the end, the youngster of the group here, <laughs> Nate Hammond, who uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to say much about who or what he is because you can Google him online. He's current and he's flying, and uh, for those of you that are here at Oshkosh, uh, you'll be able to see him this afternoon, hopefully, if the weather improves, and, uh, and Wednesday night. And, and this is a guy that, that, that flies a chipmunk. It's a super chipmunk. And I'll let him describe some of the differences and nuances of the super chipmunk. Um, I was first involved in watching Artie Scholl uh, way back when. And, and it was one of the, the greatest aerobatic in terms of smoothness. The airplane looked great. Of course, it had the big rudder. And I'll let you talk about all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but this is the kind of airplane that Nate flies. Um, and if you all are here on Wednesday night, um, he's the guy that's going to be flying the airplane that's going to be on fire up there, okay? He's, he's going to, he, he puts oh, on a, a tremendous <laughs> night show, and uh, without that, I'll just turn it over to Nate and let him talk a little bit about his airplane and what he does. He's also a skywriter, by the way, and, uh, and he can talk about that also. So, Nate, you got it. So, I come from the land of misfit airplanes. We, we took a perfect chipmunk <laughs> and, and just started cutting it up. Uh, so, the supers... Uh, the Gypsy was a great engine, but 145 horsepower. And more know. horsepower is always better. So originally with Harold Cryer, uh, Skip Volk, and Art Scholl, of course, those were the three majors that, that took a normal chipmunk and started converting it into supers. Mm -hmm. and they started with the engine. They went to Ranger engines, same thing you'd see on the Cornells, the PT airplanes, the 200 horsepower. That wasn't enough, so then they switched over to the GO 435, GO 480 Lycomings. Um, always wanting more and wanting more reliability. Eventually, we started putting IO 540s in the Lycoming version, so so 300 horsepower engines in the front. So no replacement for displacement, right? More horsepower is always better. Part of the other thing that we do to turn it into a super, and understand that all of them are different because every single one of these that becomes a super uh, goes into an experimental category, and so the list is is unending of the things you can do. Right. But majority is we cut the wings, so we will clip the wings about 36 inches on each side, um, just so that the roll rate gets a little bit better, and we reskin everything. So the, the wing is a metal leading edge, but fabric after the spar on all the, the standard aircraft. Mm -hmm. And so we get rid of the fabric and we skin it with, with aluminum, and then on some of them we even reskin the fuselage with heavier, heavier uh, uh, metal so that it has a little more torsional stability when you're... When a little you're stiffer. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now, it's still a, 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 an old lady of an airplane, right? It's 65 years old, so we treat it as such. When we're not out there yanking and banking really hard on the airplane. It's still a, a 4G airplane in the box when we're flying it. We, we want it to, to last a long time. There's no sense abusing the airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the other things that we'll do to, to make a super a little more mission ready, if you will, is. We remove some of the some of the British, some of the Canadian artifacts, such as the brake system they were talking about, the handbrake. Mm -hmm. That's gone. That's all gone. So we right. went we went with just standard tow brakes, mm -hmm. like like most airplanes today, um, mainly so that we can find parts readily available on the road. Yep. Um, the same thing with the flap system. We ended up taking out the flap handle and putting in electric flaps, mm -hmm. um, just so that we've got more room oh, in the cockpit to, to <laughs> operate. Mm -hmm. uh, now, our airplane is, is kind of special. We, we like to think it's the most famous airplane at Oshkosh that nobody knows, uh, only because generally we're sky riding with this airplane. So uh, Richard was talking about the fuel capacity, and, and our air, aircraft was the same way. We only had 30 gallons of fuel on board, but we have an auxiliary tank that holds another 30 gallons. And for Oshkosh and air shows, we can put smoke oil in that. Uh. And so we carry 30 gallons of smoke oil, 30 gallons of fuel, and we can go up over top and you'll see us sky riding, generally in the mornings and in the afternoons, uh, as long as the weather cooperates, mm -hmm. uh, over top of Oshkosh. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then, like you mentioned, Wednesday night and, and Saturday night, we also uh, we play with fireworks. So we strap on about 200 pounds of pyro onto the airplane. We bolt it onto the wingtips, um, and we set the airplane on fire, which is which is all good as long as it goes as according to plan, right? right? As we want it to go. Uh -huh. um, and and so at that point, you're you're flying aerobatics at night with the airplane on fire, 
and uh, and we design it so that so it's always always safe. We can always roll wings level at any point and just fly down aerobatically. Um, but it's something special when when you can flip on the pyro and, and and see the see the sparks coming off the wingtips. How did you get trained? I'm just curious as to how do you get trained to do night aerobatics with fires on your wings? So so it starts off as, as just being there. 90% is always just showing up. Uh, this aircraft, uh, we go back a long way. I started off as a ramp rat with this kid. Uh, with a rag when I was 10 years old, um, following the airplane around on the air show circuit, wiping it down whenever I got a chance. Um, my father started working on the airplane. He's a mechanic and, and he started ferrying the airplane. So I was around it a lot and, and had the opportunity to be around and in around the airplane. And when I turned 18, got a commercial license, uh, I started ferrying the airplane and became the crew chief for its, its previous owner, Steve Oliver. See, this aircraft was, was branded as the Pepsi Skyrider for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And so I crewed this airplane uh, from show to show and, and then eventually um, started to skywrite with it. Um, you know, it's always ears open, mouth shut, and you soak up as much information. So sitting with these gentlemen is always wonderful because you get all that information and you just soak it up. And, uh, and so that's how I, how I was taught to skywrite. There's, there was no dual, let's go out and practice. <laughs> it, was, it was, I got a phone call on a Thursday night that said, hey, you've got to go skywrite Saturday. You better go practice tomorrow, Friday. And that was, that was my introduction to skywriting. Wow. Um, and then, uh, and then the air shows was was kind of the same way. Now I had, I had been flying air shows for a long time, other aircraft, Cubs, Champs, and whatnot, decathlons. Um, but I got carted in this airplane just as a backup. Um, when Steve Oliver was flying the airplane, uh, if something happened to Steve, if, if he tripped and broke his ankle or something, we needed to be able to to salvage the air show. And so I was carted in the airplane so that I could. I could operate and fly the airplane. And actually, one of my first air shows that I flew in the airplane um, kind of came on a whim. Steve, Steve was in good shape, and he, he said, you know what, I think it's time. Why don't you go fly the airplane? And so I flew the air show, and, uh, and as I came taxiing in, I look over and I see Steve Oliver getting in the clap lap car, waving to the crowd as as I taxi the airplane in. So, you know, it's always it's always a fun fun way to start, right? The, the, the glory of air shows. Um, wow. But, but it's a wonderful airplane, and it still retains all the beauty that is a chipmunk. The control harmony is is still there. The ailerons, the rudder, and you talked about it. The balance is just phenomenal. You could have picked any airplane, but you're very happy that you've I'm chosen. I'm very happy. In fact, I tell everybody it's my one airplane. Now, I haven't flown a Corsair, right? So we got to leave the door open. Yeah, got it. But if I was destined to fly one airplane the rest of my day, it's it's honestly the chipmunk. It's it's a beautiful airplane um, with the with the larger engine. Of course, we, we cruise a little bit faster. Richard's going 99. Yeah. I can do about 130, yeah. uh, but then at the same time, it just it, it does everything that I could ever ask. Big wide gear, and you can take it off airport. It's, it loves the grass, um, and then if you get a wild hair, you push the stick around and yeah, away well, you go. Around you go. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can say thank you for uh, for your performances uh, in the past, and we look forward to Wednesday night for sure in this afternoon. Uh, fly safe out there because. Yeah, it's a, it's a dangerous business, as we all know. Um, and yeah, we look forward to it. Uh, the, the, I hadn't seen that many night shows before, and uh, and I gotta say, it, it is spectacular. And those that are here, um, hopefully we'll, the weather will be clear and we'll have a good time. Going to a quick trivia, and Richard and I talked about this, and, and we were going to ask the audience. The audience is not here, obviously. But, uh, and some of you guys may or may not know, Richard, I don't think, no, he didn't know, um, but uh, a famous uh, chipmunk aerobatic pilot named Art Scholl used to fly shows all over the world, the Pennzoil, the famous Pennzoil, you know, a logo on the side and all that. Um, but he also had a dog that flew with him. And I was just wondering if anybody might know the name of the dog that flew with him. That's all right. Well, okay. I'll, have, I'll have to step back because I certainly know this story. Uh, so I'll give them a, a chance. Pancho? No, 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 it's not Pancho. Okay. 
All right, Nate, you could be the winner. So, so the dog was Aileron. There you go. That is that's that's right. Right. Yes. 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 Aileron. Aileron rode with him everywhere and, and then would run out and sit on the wingtip as he would taxi in <laughs> yeah. and ride, ride the wingtip all the way Okay, in. okay. Uh, well, I, I hadn't heard that part of the story, but, I, but Aileron was the name of the dog. Aileron. And uh, so you win today. And even and, though I didn't know the answer, I'm not going to get into a flap about it. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But I will end it. Um, I think our time is up at this point, and I will thank all of you gentlemen for uh, all the, uh, uh, the, the stories. Uh, thank you for your service with the Royal Canadian Air Force. We appreciate that very much, a close ally. Um, I, I will say the only time I had contact with the Royal Canadian Air Force was uh, in Winnipeg, and they taught me how to play a game called crud up there <laughs> on, a, on a pool table. Okay. And, and, but, but then also, back in my flying days, we did fly against some, I was an F-16 pilot, and I flew against some uh, CF-18s. And uh, I gotta say, I think as I remember, in the dissimilar air combat arena, I think we split. I think it was one and one. So you guys have some very good pilots up there, and we appreciate uh, being able to, to work with them. Yeah. But, uh, but otherwise, hey, I'll say happy birthday, to the chipmunk. Thank you so much for uh, well, for, 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 for yeah. being here, for having a good time, uh, for being in Oshkosh, and uh, all of you guys uh, fly safe out there, and uh, we look forward to this afternoon and Wednesday night. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>